Hello there, you're very welcome along to Sunday's Off The Ball. Joe Malloy with you through until 7 o'clock. We have the Manchester Derby coming your way. Half past four, Kenny Cunningham back with us and Nathan Murphy calling the action. At two o'clock, Liverpool against Fulham coming your way. Stephen Doyle and Brian Kerr on that game. In the meantime, we'll review the Sunday papers in just a few moments. 53106 is the text number. We're at Off The Ball on Twitter. Neil Tracy will be along as well for the afternoon on updates. Just to give you some immediate news, though, the uh, first Premier League game of the day, second half just starting, a nil all between West Brom and Newcastle. Stephen Kenny, I suspect, watching Darrow O'Shea and Kieran Clark very closely. In Scotland, second half also starting, Dundee United and Celtic nil all in the Scottish Premiership. Anything other than a win for Celtic means Rangers are champions today. And then the European Indoor is the latest. Fourth place finish, not enough for Sarah Lavin to qualify for the 60 metres hurdles final in Poland. Kira Neville also out today. She missed out on a place in the 60 metres final, finished seventh in her uh, semi final. Sean Tobin takes to the track in the 3,000 metre final just before five o'clock this evening. We'll jump right in with the paper review. So the headlines, first of all, uh, Sunday Times have a big picture of Alex Ferguson and the dramatic headline there was an 80% chance I would die. I'm sure uh, lots of you have seen there's a new uh, movie coming out about the ordeal directed by Ferguson's son and it premiered on Friday night so there's more detail about what happened to Ferguson and like he says here an 80% chance he was going to die. Uh, we'll come to more of that there's some details inside. Also on the front page Lions UK tour approved in summer of sports plans. This is Stephen Jones here and he is saying that the planned British and Irish Lions tour to South Africa will now take place in Britain and Ireland. That's the only conclusion he writes to be drawn after Westminster government sources told the Lions Committee that they are backing the home tour. Jones says uh, the likelihood is there will be four tests with South Africa at Twickenham, Murrayfield, the Principality Stadium and the Aviva Stadium. Irish government approval uh, needed for this last fixture, although that is expected. And it says later on, it now appears that key figures in Westminster view the Lions series against the world champions as an integral part of the summer festival of sport. They're obviously planning over in the UK to have 10,000 fans at Premier League games from May 17th. So that's the latest on the Lions. And then if you want some good news when it comes to sport, also another interesting story on the front page of the Sunday Times. Experts find no evidence that COVID transmitted on field. Martin Ziegler here on the front page. Not a single case of on-the-field transmission of the COVID-19 virus has been confirmed in football, rugby union, rugby league or American football during a full year of the pandemic, medical experts have revealed. So they have done a detailed tracing of players and in every case where there was transmission, it was put down to off-the-field contacts such as uh, meeting rooms, cars, indoor activities. There's a quote from a Professor James Calder. He's the surgeon. He's the independent chairman of this government uh, committee over in England. And he says, we have not had any cases of transmission on the pitch in football. It is what happens off the pitch in the changing rooms, car sharing, social distancing not happening. That appears to be the risk. He says there was concern that sports such as rugby could have very different problems compared to football and cricket. But those sports have done very good work to identify the risks on the field. So uh, a Dr. Simon Kemp, who's uh, head of sports medicine at the RFU, says there isn't a single definite case in rugby in terms of on-field transmission. So uh, that's a relief. There were obviously huge worries over things like the scrum in particular when it came to rugby. Uh, the Sunday Independent then have Leinster on the front page booking their place in the Pro 14 final. They beat Ulster last night by 38 points to 19. Over on the right-hand side, Foster set to take over the reins at Elliott's Yard. This is uh, Denise Foster set to take over the reins at Gordon Elliott's Yard following his uh, six-month ban. Uh, Thomas Kelly here. Foster sent out ten winners over the past five seasons on the flat and over jumps combined will take over the licence. There's a statement on, from the Elliott stable over the weekend. Denise, vastly experienced. Her appointment is great news for staff and owners. Gordon will be available to assist her as she requires. So that means that all the Elliot horses will compete at Cheltenham and beyond under Denise Foster's name. And uh, if you're worried about the Irish injury situation, Roy Hodgson not helping <laughs> your mood. He says it's pie in the sky, any chance I've, I've talked that James McCarthy will be fit to play for the Republic of Ireland uh, this month. He's had a reoccurrence of the groin strain which has hampered his season. So Hodgson says no chance. 
Manchester Derby is all over a lot of the back pages. Uh, we're the culture club. This is Solskjaer talking about the likes of Busby and Ferguson, and that's the philosophy that will make Manchester United great again. The Mail on Sunday, again, it's Solskjaer here. No place to hide, and the subheading is, with no end in sight to dominance of rampant city, Ole feels the heat ahead of Derby showdown. Sunday World, again, it's Solskjaer. Close, but no Solskjaer. Ollie insists he's building a team to revive the glory days and bring trophies uh, back to Old Trafford, but the sense is he's not all that close to it. And then Man City versus Manchester United. Uh, this is Harry Maguire saying that the next fortnight is crucial. The next two weeks will define our season. They've got an FA Cup tie, they have AC Milan in the Europa League, and they have the Manchester Derby this afternoon. Very happy to say we're joined by Ral Nugent. Uh, you'll see his work at the moment on the Six Nations World Feed, BT Sport commentator, former head of RTE Sport, Dan McDonald of the Irish Independent, also with us. Evening, gents, or afternoon, gents, rather. Great to have you with us. Afternoon. <laughs> Evening. That's wishful thinking on my part. <laughs> um, so a, a, a Lions tour, Ryle, this is unprecedented, I suppose. Maybe it's not unprecedented, but we're going back a bloody long way, that's for sure. It looks like South Africa coming to Ireland and the UK, it seems. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure how anybody's going to feel about that. Um, I, I'm, I'm kind of caught in, in no man's land on it. I, I'm, I'm, I, a postponement of the tour to next year just isn't feasible, you think, when there's got all the summer tours are already booked in and that's going to cause additional hardship for all the associations uh, in terms of, or all the federations in terms of, of being able to receive uh, the, the incoming tours and the financial uh, impact that that has. So you're you're really at a point where you either come up with a solution for the Lions for this year, or you say it's it's not going to happen uh, uh, for for one uh, cycle. Uh, and if the I thought the Australia idea was a really interesting one uh, of of moving it to Australia and allowing it to be a tour, and now it's a reverse tour, uh, reverse Lions tour. At least that seems to be the most likely outcome. And I'm I'm cold on it. Uh, I'd be really interested to hear what the players have got to say about it um, and how they feel about going into something like that. Because the thought of going on a Lions tour and all that that means uh, is is part of the attraction, I think. Um, the thought of doing it at home, potentially in front of at least one-third empty or two-third empty stadiums, I just wonder, does it take the gloss off it? And, and how everybody... So right now, I don't have a strong view on it. I'm lukewarm, is, 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 I guess, the best I can say. OK. Let's jump into the papers then. Loads of good stuff right across the board. The Gordon Elliott uh, story, as you can imagine, looms large. There is coverage everywhere. Dan, as an overview, what would you say is the general theme on the Elliott situation today? Everywhere. Dan, as an overview, what would you say is the general theme on the Elliott situation today? Yeah, the... There's, there's there's a there's a lot out there, Joe. As you say, I mean, there's 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 probably a, a between 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 the coverage. There's obviously two sides of it. Sorry, Joe, I'm hearing I'm hearing myself back in my ear here. Sorry, I can't hear myself so bad. Yeah, I think we're having some technical problem. I'm the same. We'll take a very short ad break. You're going to hear this in about 20 seconds. We'll take a very short ad break. We'll get that sorted out rather than persevere for the time being. Back in one sec. Apologies, folks. Off the ball on News Talk. Future of Work with Jess Kelly and Gavin McLaughlin. On episode one of the new series of Future of Work, we're looking at well-being. What does it mean? What role do managers play? And what are the consequences of getting it wrong? Future of Work with Jess Kelly and Gavin McLaughlin. Thanks to VHI Healthcare. On News Talk. Listen and subscribe to the podcast now on Newstalk.com or on the Newstalk app. Make it a really good afternoon and check out the great car insurance discounts at insuremycars.ie Ireland's trusted car insurance specialists For super family savings, check out insuremycars.ie City Financial Marketing Group Limited Trading as insuremycars.ie is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland Now at Power City, live healthy like a Bosch with up to €100 Euro cash back across selected Bosch home appliances to find out more, go online to powercity.ie today. Dundeal has the largest range of premium cars in Ireland from all of Ireland's trusted car dealerships. That's why you will find Leinster's Frank Keen BMW on Dundeal. Stop by and connect with Frank Keen BMW on Dundeal today and they will deal directly and deliver safely to you. Done deal for deals to feel great about from all of Ireland's trusted car dealerships. If you're aged 80 or over, 
you'll be offered a free COVID-19 vaccine next. You don't need to register in advance. As soon as your vaccine is available, your GP will let you know. Everyone else will be offered the vaccine when it's their turn. If you have questions about your COVID-19 vaccine, we have answers you can trust on hse.ie. Or you can call HSE Live on 1850 24 1850 from the HSE. Why have thousands of Irish businesses already signed up for the Advantage card from OnPost Commerce? Well, it gives you a massive 34% off standard parcel labels and discounted stamps too, helping you cut your delivery costs. So make sure your business is taking full advantage of these fantastic savings. Get yours free today at your local post office or visit onpost.com slash advantage card. OnPost Commerce for your world. Terms and conditions apply. Offer ends April 30th. This is a message from the heart, the Irish Heart Foundation. And it's to say a huge thank you to Dunn Stores and their customers for supporting the Show Some Heart Appeal on Valentine's weekend. Together we're preventing heart disease and stroke, saving lives and transforming recovery because every heart matters. Thank you. Sean, what's that thing going round the garden? That is my, uh, our new Husqvarna auto mower. Auto mower? Yeah, it's a robotic lawnmower from Husqvarna. Cuts the grass automatically, has GPS tracking and an app. Even works in the rain. Hmm. I just thought, why spend time cutting grass when I could spend it with the family? Great! You can put the dinner on, so... Ah, no can do, love. I have to paint the man cave. Husqvarna auto mower. Never mow again. Learn more at husqvarna.ie. Well, we moved to SSE Airtricity. It's terrific that we're saving money. It's nice to be part of something positive, and especially when you think of the grandchildren. Switch to 100% green electricity today and enjoy €270 Euro welcome credit and 10% off electricity and gas. Free phone 1-800-818-466 or visit sseairtricity.com. This is Generation Green. EAB 1,797 euro 88 cent. Offer from the 15th to the 7th, 2019. Rates valid from the 1st to the 5th, 2020. Subject to change. One year standard unit rate discount for new home electricity and gas customers and direct debit and EBIL. For details of T's and C's, EAB, rates, exit fees, standing charge and green energy claims, see sseartricity.com. Fuel the future, the reboot. Join Fuel for a free virtual event tackling critical questions about what life looks like post-COVID. Our expert panel includes economist David McWilliams, GP Sumi Dunn, Man Managing Director of Festival Republic and Electric Picnic, Melvin Benn, and World Rugby Council's Sue Carty. If 80% are to be vaccinated by June, why wouldn't a festival go ahead? Is working from home here to stay? Join us live on March the 10th at 12.30pm. To register, visit fuelthefuture.ie. Off the ball. This, this is News Talk. You're very welcome, Mac. Joe Malloy with you this afternoon. We are reviewing the Sunday papers. Ryle Nugent and Dan McDonald with us. Dan, we had some technical issues just before the break. Hopefully we're good to go. I was just asking you on the Gordon Elliott story then, which is everywhere, as you can imagine, across the Sunday papers. Broad overview, what's your sense of the coverage? Yeah, well, there's, there's two sides to it, Joe. I mean, there's obviously uh, there's some people like Sunday columnists who are probably having their first hit at it to some degree. Um, and then there's probably aspects of the coverage itself, the story itself, which is moving on. Like I picked up the Racing Post, for example, and, and that's you know almost completely moved on to the issue of uh, Denise Foster coming in to take over the yard and almost looking ahead and... and you know, they've obviously been living the story every day for the week, so things are sort of moving on there, whereas for some columnists, it's their first shot at it. Um, and, and to be fair, it's probably been covered in such depth. I mean, there's some, some good pieces out there, but because it's been covered in such depth across the week, um, you know, I guess a lot of it is almost coming around to consensus view at this stage. Um, you know, a, a general tone across various pieces, Eamon Sweeney, um, Roy Carter, Shane McGrath, slightly different. Shane McGrath more so on maybe the welfare side of things, but but still a lot of it coming back around to the view that you know Gordon Elliott has has got a punishment. Maybe the over the, a lot of the initial reaction might have been over the top, um, and the, the the general theme of you know the the uh, attack on him and maybe did it go too far. Um, but I think you know it's it, I think people I think people have probably reached that view almost. I think the news cycle have probably reached that by Wednesday, Thursday. Anyway, I feel. But there's still some pieces making that point today. But I did think the most interesting stuff was probably uh, the Sunday Times stuff, to be honest. The David Walsh column on the back page of the Sunday Times and then a Dennis Walsh piece inside 
just from two different perspectives. David Walsh's column, just a journalistic point of view. I mean, he's, he's obviously writing for the English Sunday Times, but it's carried in the Irish edition, but obviously pretty geared towards the UK audience. And his piece goes into the general issue of um, welfare of horses. And, um, you know, the, the, uh, it, it takes the debate in a slightly different way. And I think it's a good piece. It's, 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 it's giving a voice to a, probably another point of view um, from Maddie, Maddie Doyle is the name of the person he speaks to. She's a volunteer for the Kildare branch of My Lovely Horse, a welfare charity that rescues abandoned horses. Just talking to her about some of her experiences, including an instance in, I think, 2018, a member of the public contacting her, uh, the, the organisation, saying they'd spotted a number of horses wandering in a, a wooded area in County Kildare. Uh, race horses have microchips inserted in them, which means that they can be identified. And while most of the horses, the strays they pick up aren't ex race horses, in this case, it did have a couple of race horses. And that is the in introduction to a, a piece that talks about the need for racing to do more, perhaps from a welfare, welfare point of view. Now, it is aimed towards a, a UK audience, as I said, but I think this is a relevant point. Like I wrote about this story during the week, and I'm coming at it from the perspective of you know, a massive racing fan, um, you know, someone who's owned horses like a, a sort of very low level in, in syndicates and stuff like that, I mean, you know, quite a few horses. And I, mean, I love the game, I love the sport, but obviously you, you go into the game with your eyes open, you go into the sport with your eyes open. If you're a fan of it, like you know that, that you know, horses dying is a, is a part of it. Um, and I, you also have to appreciate that some people you know, will feel very uncomfortable about that. And you have to accept that it's almost like a pact that you enter into. It's the price you pay. And it's not always going to be for everyone. Um, but I, I think in the, in, the, in the backlash, I suppose, to the backlash, you know, the point has been made uh, that you know, these horses get you know, terrific care and love and they get looked after. And Elliot Pose are going to, you know, it's just such a stupid thing to do. I think there's sort of unanimity on that, I think, at this stage. But the broader point is that the horses are very well looked after. But to be fair, David Walsh does raise a valid point that still there are probably questions that have to be raised about what happens to horses when they finish racing. Um, I, I didn't actually write about it in the piece I did during the week, but I was going to refer to it in Australia a year or two back. There was a big uh, sort of a panorama style investigation into uh, the number of ex race horses that ended up going to sort of abattoirs and how they were treated. And it was very shocking for the Australian public and Australia's attitude towards racing is, um, you know, it's, it's very different to maybe over here. Jumps racing is banned in several states. And there is like a feeling that maybe the UK, there is certainly a lobby pushing that way. And, and, and this piece by David Walsh, I think, backs up the point that really, you know, racing has to be on top of everything because, you know, from the sort of welfare perspective, um, that, you know, if there are sort of aberrations, and as he makes the point, I think, you know, the discovery of um, these horses in 2018 wasn't a one-off. There was 11 abandoned horses in Cork three months later and another unfortunate one-off. And I think there's like a lot of eyes on the sport right now. And I just think it's a good piece in terms of, listen, explaining that there are other issues, yeah. you know, in welfare that need to be touched on. Also touches on uh, sort of the medicalization of horse racing, the use of sort of uh, anti-inflammatories and, and legal... Uh, performance enhancing drugs and, and what that says about welfare but that's obviously tailored towards the uk audience dennis walsh piece is more about the owners and how they save yeah. gordon elliott that's interesting stuff yeah the byline on walsh's piece is look beyond elliott's callous pose and you'll find stories of neglect of abandoned race horses the authorities must do more about welfare it's interesting that one of those abandoned horses turns out to be war celeste uh, five years before she had been um bought for 254 thousand uh, guineas and they nursed her back to health several of the horses they found had to be euthanized but they nursed her back to health and uh, the, maddie who works for my lovely horse said i just thought wow she's the most beautiful an animal and 10 or more breeders uh, pleaded for the opportunity to adopt the mare with a view to putting her in foal some offered generous donations to the charity but we thought no racing had its chance with war celeste it only wanted her back because there was again the chance of making money from her and then Walsh finishes by saying, Gordon Elliott's unthinking callousness has reminded racing authorities of its responsibilities. What a shame it would be if the sport didn't learn from it. You were coming in there, Rob. Yeah, I, I think 
you know, Dan's point is well made. There's been a a lot of coverage. I think a couple of things. One, you you would need to be a working journalist in it to keep on top of everything that's been said and what's that's been written. So so all the papers give you a decent overview. <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, 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 this weekend about about what's happened, where it's at, and where it's uh, potentially going. There are so many layers to this. I flip flopped on this all week in in my own sense of what's of of, of where it is and and where it's going. Um, I thought the moral outrage stuff halfway through the week uh, was was beyond my comprehension. I mean, I, I, in terms of moral outrage, you look at things that have happened in Irish sport in the last twelve months, and then you contextualise this and the reaction to it, and you wonder how we've gotten to where we've gotten. I mean, with with the exception of the John Delaney FAI story, I, I can't think of another story that's just gone through as much newspaper print and uh, airwaves on both TV and radio as, as this story has. And yet you 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 think of the moral outrage that should be uh, looked at in terms of even the John McLean story in 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 the uh, Indo today, brilliantly done by Brendan Fanning. And I know we're going to get to that. And, and and the racism against young athletes in this country and and the gangland money and MTK uh, and and the the association with professional boxing and 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 you can go back to the wonderful work done on the on the George Gibney story by by uh, Mark Horgan and the team and and still we have no answers as to how we ended up there and and what's been done to address the issue that that we still aren't in a position to have 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 George Gibney come back and answer the charges so so there are, there are a myriad of of issues in Irish sport and yet the moral outrage around this story and I understand part of it because there's a simplicity to the story in that man on horse doing what he shouldn't be doing unequivocally wrong and should be punished. And yet we, we, we're we still here a week later and we're still talking about it. I think what it has done is it, it's, it's now brought on another layer, which is racing looking at itself in all its, uh, and all its issues. And, and with that in mind, the Sunday Business Post on pages 18 and 19 do a really good job of of putting the the Gordon Elliott story in the middle of all the issues that are there for racing right now, both in Ireland and in the UK, um, and it's written by uh, Aaron Rogan and, and Barry White, and and then there's also a piece from a man from this parish, from Johnny Ward, um, and and all very very good uh, in terms of of giving you a sense of of what the industry is facing and the concerns and the worries that those in it have and those from the outside looking in. Are, are asking itself. I do have to say one other thing on mm-hmm. it. I'm really surprised at the, the lack of reaction so far to the to the statement made by Gordon Elliott Racing. Um, and it's there, uh, you quoted it earlier, um, uh, on the front page of the Sunday Independent. Um, Denise has a vast experience and her appointment is great news for staff and owners. Gordon will be available to assist her as she requires. Now, like... Uh, the communications around Gordon Elliott's uh, uh, press releases at times have been uh, right up there with uh, what's gone on with government and, and COVID vaccines. Uh, it, it's been shambolic. And and that, that statement has since been readjusted online to remove that line. I mean, I mean Paul Hayward, who's a, a very well-renowned uh, journalist in the UK, he's got 250,000-odd followers on Twitter. His reaction to that statement was, oh, dear, Gordon will be available to assist her as she requires. That's not a ban. It's a flag of convenience. I'd be surprised if Cheltenham, et cetera, accept that. And it's not an unreasonable point. Like, the first reaction of Gordon Elliott to the to the publishing of the photograph was, was not a good look in terms of the statement that was made. I had a sense as the week progressed and the other statements came out that there was a genuine belief that he understood what damage he'd done here. Mm. And then you get a communication like this that then is readjusted, and you have to say to yourself, like, like, what is going on here? Mm. Uh, because because Paul Paul Hayward's right, like that is a flag of convenience. If Gordon Elliott is just going to put somebody else in and continue to do the job, racing is going to have an even bigger problem in a week's time because Cheltenham is coming, and that that floodlight will be will be on on the situation again. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, I'm just going to comment on that because it's interesting. I, I thought the story had run its course to some degree, but uh, it's just interesting this morning watching the, the racing TV, Nick Luck, the broadcasters, his show, and there was a race, a senior racing post journalist on it still arguing that, that Gordon Elliott's horses, inverted commas, 
there would be now Denise Foster's horses shouldn't be allowed run at the Chatham Festival. Or not that they shouldn't be allowed run, that they should be pulled out. It was not necessarily looking for a decree, more so looking that they would voluntarily sign out. Now that's I think there's been a pretty angry reaction to that, you know, because I mean it would be very unfair on the owners, you know, staff, people in the yard have done very little wrong. But again, it, it exposes the fact that it's a, it's a UK reaction uh, to it, and they're probably fearing that if there is a winner for um, you, know, you know the Denise Foster trained horse, um, that 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 will cause a storm, you know, and, and it does seem that would be the case. I mean, we have a situation where you know uh, you know Charles Burns is starting a ban for a very separate uh, separate instance. Uh, one of his old horses won the other night in the same colours, ridden by his son, but under a different trainer's name, um, who has now taken over the care of his horses. And that just raises people's questions as to the extent to which, well, you know, there's still a, a visibility from the, uh, the, you know, the, the old trainer who is supposed to be at the game at the moment. And, like, I, I suppose we all probably deep down, we all know that if, the, you know, that Denise Foster is in there, of course, she, like, you know, animals are creatures of habit. And of course, she will be ringing Gordon Elliott to talk about these animals. That's a normal thing we would expect to happen. But that probably shines a, a light on, are people happy with the, the punishment? No, I actually thought the ban was perfectly fair. I think the ban was a very reasonable and fair punishment. But there's certainly, again, it comes back to optics and the optics of how to hand over uh, to someone else taking over the yard. It's going to be scrutinised pretty closely, you would have to say, and, and shows that maybe there's the story isn't 100% gone away and it perhaps in a way that I thought it might because, yeah, maybe in Cheltenham, if Denise Foster has the three or four winners, um, maybe we're coming back to this topic again. I've seen yeah, a few, yeah I, seen I, a few. I, I agree for what it's yeah, worth. I, okay. I just, I think it's worth saying, I, I, I think that the optics of this are all wrong uh, and, and, and they need to be really, really careful about what they say and how they say it and what actually happens in the, in the coming uh, couple of weeks. And, and you add that statement, Cheltenham coming, and uh, the inference in the uh, in the IHRB, or not the inference, the statement in the IHRB ruling that that there was a there was a trend here towards uh, Gordon being set up uh, to be ruined, mm. and 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 that brings its own questions as well. You 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 wonder. Uh, will, will we still be talking about this in a week's time or two weeks' time or part of this story? And I think the answer to that is yes. Certainly the Denise Foster and he'll be assisting her angle is bigger in the UK than it is here at the moment. We'll have to see how that all plays out. I think there's probably a wider sense that even if he is assisting or helping out, he's suffered enough. And yeah. that's probably part of people's thinking. Like I, on Monday, I would hold my hands up. I was very critical of the statement. I thought the statement had to be criticised. I didn't think... It could just be accepted as, you know, this is the explanation of events. And I know, agree with you, by the way, on that 100 percent. Right. 100 percent. And I, I didn't feel good about doing that, actually. You know, I felt, felt um, I, as I watched the week unfold, I thought, oh, you know, he's having such a horrible time. But the initial statement was just we, we couldn't uh, just say, oh, well, that's fair enough if that's what happened, because it didn't ring. Uh, true. But as the week transpired, Chievely stood on Tuesday is a massive blow and I mean, it was amazing on social media in particular, people were saying, well, he should be banned for life. And the thing was getting out of hand. And on Monday, even with the only statement at that stage saying, well, it was, you know, we're misreading the picture. Even on Monday, we made the point here that there should still be forgiveness, there should still be a redemption. And my, my sense of that increased across the week. Um, and so I think with the Chievely Stud stuff, just with the size of the story and the extent to which now Elliot will always be associated with that photo, by the time Friday came around, I think a lot of people felt, well, like, the ban is almost incidental. And, yes, it's six months. Dan, you know you're racing more than me. I mean, I read that as well. You know, it's, it's akin to a two- or three-month ban because things wind down in the summer anyway, and he's back in yeah. August. And so yeah. there's probably, we, we probably have reached a point where what, what is the value of endangering his livelihood, the livelihood of the 80 staff? And if Denise Foster coming in and being assisted by Elliot keeps the show on the road, keeps owners happy. I mean, like, what, what, what do we want here? We, we, can't, we can't run the whole thing into the ground. That wouldn't be appropriate for the crime, you know? Yeah, no, Eamon I, Sweeney. Sorry, sorry, Dan, you go ahead. No, I was just going to say, like, I mean, and I'll let Ryle come back in on that as well. And, like, you know, so much of racing, there's a sort of, sort of a nod and wink aspect to a lot of things, you know? Like, mm. you sort of know there's a lot of things about the sport that isn't perfect. You know, you, you, you know, there's, there's a broader issue of like, you know, you can talk about, 
non-trying horses and races and all, all sorts of issues with racing that there's quirks of the sport that that people involved in it are sort of aware of it and you know it, that that this one episode became um got to the stage where this is the one where we need the strong sanction from the authorities that's where i think it lost you know, there was that initial anger that a lot of people felt, probably and even including, like I probably felt it myself on Monday, but I think across the week people have realised, well, racing has other issues it needs to look at in terms of its, you know, regulation, you know, and, you know, even the fact that we, and I'm doing it myself, I'm guilty of it, like I'm framing it so much in the context of, well, how they're viewing it in the UK and Britain, and I think as, you know, Johnny Ward points out in his piece in the Business Post today, he does have the trainer, Brendan Duke, pointing out that the British Horse Racing Authority in England are wading into this topic with relish yeah. because as, as, as the simplicity to it as almost as, as Royal says, yeah, you know, the, the issue around Sheikh Mohammed, the panorama documentary, it's hard to sort of explain it in 30 seconds, but obviously there's a sort of a broader issue of like um, a, a, a murky situation around his daughter. And he's still someone who bankrolls the sport in the UK considerably. And really, until in the racing post yesterday, there was a brief comment from the new BHA head. They haven't really addressed that issue at all, yet the Gordon Elliott photo, they've almost got stuck into it. And there's a lot of other things in racing that you know you would you would think that if you go down the road of coming down really, really hard on this, like where do you stop? And I think that that's part of the um that's part of the way that racing has been wrestling with itself this week, I believe, as well, too, because you know it's by far from a perfect world. And I think people are maybe thinking this photo really isn't like it, there's a public perception that comes with it, but there's obviously other problems the sport faces that are probably arguably far more serious. Yeah, and with that in mind, I think pages 18 and 19 in the Sunday Business Post do the job of putting it all in context for you. Hmm. Is this a, is a, the, the current ban? I mean, it's akin to a touchline ban for a manager. Like, is, is that not fair enough? Well, I mean, like, yeah, like, I think the ban is completely fair. I mean, I, th I think it's just a, a case of, like, you know, a manager gets a touchline ban and you still know he's on the he's on the phone to the assistant on the bench, yeah. you know? And But but I think, you know, I, I like, Gordon Elliott has still lost, you know, the Chief Lee Park courses, including, um, you know, Envoy Allen, and they're not coming back, you know, as far as we can see, you know? And that is, uh, to me, like, that is a, a serious blow, um, and I, that's why just to get back to the papers aspect, the Dennis Walls piece is is quite good because it, it details like even the support of Giggins 10 and Michael O'Leary from a longer term perspective is isn't that relevant because they're they're pulling back out of the sport. But uh, it points out that the the key part of this week behind the scenes was the 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 Morins. It's a new family, Noel and, and Valerie Morin, uh, who effectively are, are new money in the sense that they started from nothing 10 years ago and built up a, a company called Prepaid Financial Services uh, for a windfall of uh, 266 million euros. They sold it. They sponsored the yard. They've come in and they're a big, they're a big sort of player. And their, their decision to stand by Gordon Elliott, I think, is like a key part of the week and a key part of his future. Like there was a possibility during the week that, like, that the other owners would have all followed suit from Cheveley Park and pulled out. And then he would have been destroyed, really, you know, in terms of everything he made up. But uh, but he still has suffered. He's lost some good horses. His name is, you know, is is tainted a bit, you know, from, from this, or certainly in, in a lot of people's eyes, it will be permanently, that view will be held. Mm. Um, but he's missing a whole year of festivals. Um, and he'll come back, as you mentioned, like he'll miss Galway, but really national hunt-wise, he comes back next September. But I don't know how you can manage the ban in any way. As you say, touchline ban is an interesting point. Because unless you get someone to completely go to a different country or something and leave the sport completely, like, of course, he's going to be around and yeah. offering some insight. And you could all go to argue, by the way, if you're talking about welfare being the bottom line here, you know, someone who intimately knows the personality of the horses, possibly in a, in a way, was always going to be offering advice rather than a trainer coming in mm. and uh, doing their own thing, which could, in some respects, like have some sort of a... Uh, you know, yeah. damaging impact, you know, yeah. so you can yeah. you can take that point to its natural end, you can yeah. argue it both ways. Okay, well we should we should move on because we can labour this point, although the coverage is extensive as you mean. I was wondering will we get a blow-by-blow -blow account of the hearing on Friday? We don't really, I mean, no. Dennis Walsh makes the point, although this is in the I H or B statement, that Elliot offered, quote, no credible explanation to us. And Dennis Walsh makes the point, this should have been Elliot's public position from the beginning. I think I think that Monday statement, Ryle, as you said, didn't help. You know, it just when, when the only dispatch was one that people just didn't buy. 
it was just the wrong even, thing to do. Even, you just even in, yeah, no, I agree with you on that. But even in addition to that, Joe, like having a statement where you where and I, and I absolutely accept that no one believed that Gordon Elliott was going to disappear behind a rock for the next six months and not have any engagement with. Uh, with the, the 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 training or the involvement with his horse and with the horses that are under his care, however, along with that statement on Monday, you now have a statement again that was made last night that has had to be tweaked because it wasn't the optics of it and the messaging around it were going to be interpreted in such a way that the story wouldn't go away. Yeah. And 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 I don't know who's having those discussions with him about his communications, yeah. but they need to stop. <laughs> Yeah, he was let down on Monday, I think. I mean, I'm sure he yeah, took I agree. advice. And, and however it was concocted, I mean, it was just not the right way. And it was funny when he himself spoke to David Jennings after, and it was just a, look, it's a moment of madness. That's, you know, suddenly the, the, the kind of honesty comes out and everyone can kind of say, well, OK, I mean, geez, we've all had them. Yeah. We've all had them. A absolutely. A a absolutely. OK, we'll move on. Um, just a warning, because our next story is of a mature adult nature and also will... Uh, potentially affect uh, people out there uh, sensitive to this. It's on the John McLean story. So if you have children near the radio or you are somebody who might find that conversation upsetting, just want to give you fair warning and say now might be a good time to just switch off the radio for five minutes and then you can come back to us. So John McLean, uh, sentenced to eight years, he's in Mount Joy at the moment. Uh, Ryle, Brendan Fanning is writing about McLean in the uh, Sunday Independent. You thought it was a good piece? Um, yeah, you've got to be careful of even using the word good in that context. But yeah, I, I mean, it was a piece of, of absolute uh, honesty and firsthand engagement by Brendan with, with John McLean over the years. And he, and he lays out uh, uh, one particular meeting with him where where he uh, saw that he didn't look well. It was the last time that he spoke to him before the news came out. And, and then six months later, the Village magazine named him as uh, a child abuser in Terrier College. And and Brendan uh, uh, goes on to talk about uh, about some of the references that have been made that the dogs in the street knew that this was happening. And, and I think his quote is, not this dog. And, and then he goes on to uh, outline what has happened and and why it's happened, and and really his last paragraph, uh, for me sums up uh, uh, the article really well. It says without clarity on how this happened, without knowing how McLean's transition from one job to another was so smooth, without any commitment to lift lids and shake trees and see what falls out, James McLean's victims will have unanswered questions. If you were a member of UCD Rugby Football Club, you'd have some questions of your own. Uh, and it's 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 a it's a harrowing story. It's a it's almost a first hand tale uh, from from Brendan, um, and it is it is extremely well constructed and delivered, and it is worth uh, it is worth your time to understand it. And and we we go back to that uh, issue about things that are are worth us. I I think as an industry, as in the sports industry, uh, um. And as a society, having real moral outrage about, mm -hmm. for me, this is the area. These are the things worth real moral outrage, worth worth phone-in shows, worth uh, uh, political and and current affairs uh, shows. Time like answers to the questions that are there. In so many ways, to give to give voice to those that were involved and and were abused in that time, to recognise what they went through and to ensure that it doesn't happen again, that's worth our moral outrage, in my opinion. Mm. There's almost, um, not a jovial start to it, but such a kind of, uh, heading to a Clontarf under 20s match and heading down to Dora Doyle and picking up some players along the way. And then this is Clontarf and then they bump into the UCD AIL side. They're en route to play Cork Con and he has a chat with John McLean. And as you said, doesn't think he looks uh, well. And six months later, he understands maybe there's a, a stress aspect to his appearance when Village Magazine uh, name him and he asks around people he knows if they knew, if the dogs in the street knew and a few uh, friends say yes, a f uh, some others say no and then Brendan charts his own school experience and it's horrific and there's this sense of well in the 70s and 80s in Ireland there were just always people in schools, men in schools to be avoided and he names some deceased priests who 
you know, uh, uh, there are deep, deep suspicions over them. We don't need to go into massive detail here at uh, quarter to two on the radio. And then he comes back, as you said, Ryle, his point is about UCD and about Terenure and how John McLean goes from Terenure in 1996 to UCD. And that's the question, you know, if you're saying if we're calling into uh, phone-in shows or, or asking questions, that's the question that needs to be asked. How badly do the lads in UCD feel at having been taken in by McLean? He writes, if I felt stupid for having been friendly to him and treating him with respect, how did they feel for embracing him as a vital cog in their rugby machine, their director of rugby, no less? And he points out that even though McLean retired in 2011, Brennan Fanning says, except he never went away, I kept bumping into him at UCD games where he would be with the team inside the barrier, to all appearances a central part of the setup. And the questions, as you, you read out the closer to his piece, the questions he wants answered are, how did this happen? And he, he says, yeah. you know, without a commitment to lift lids and to shake trees and see what falls out, McLean's victims will have unanswered questions. Um, now, how, I guess the, 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 we would all support that, I suspect, you know, to find out how this happened. Was there, you know, I mean, recommendations from Terenure, or did anyone know anything, then they should have said something, or what happened? And, you know, I stress, not accusing anybody at uh, UCD of anything here. Uh, I, I really stress that. But his point is, well, we need to find out more. The question might be, Ryle, what's the appropriate forum to do that? I mean, uh, publicly, I guess, behind the scenes, do you set up a tribunal? Do you ask somebody to come in and look at it externally? I mean, uh, I, I presume there's a, a way to do it. Um, and you would hope maybe that's well, happening. Well, I yeah, I, I, that that is a good question. I mean, just because it's not public doesn't mean it's not happening. Although you do have to, you do have to wonder whether whether that is is just a pipe dream on on my behalf uh, that that it might be happening. I, I guess I don't have the answer to that. But my my, but but the answer I would give is that it's not just good enough to leave this or any issue in this realm where it is that there there has been too much there continues to be too much and I, and I have this horrible sense that there is significantly not slightly significantly more of this that we don't know about in the sports sphere from that time up to a more modern time and and and, and who knows about today you, you you would you would hope and believe not with the with the uh, situations having gone moved forward and 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 safety measures put in place you would hope but but you can't just leave it where it is you, you can't just say well like we're talking about 2011 here joe we're not talking about 1975 not that that should make an, an, any difference if, if it happened to you in 1975 or whether it happened to you in 2011 isn't really relevant but we are only talking within the last uh, eight or nine years yeah and 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 there are questions that remain and and the answer to what do you do with it well it's got to be picked up by by if the word I hate the word tribunal because it conjures up uh, something that actually doesn't deliver an enormous amount or at least that's my view of tribunals in this country over the years not in all cases but in many but but there has to be some uh, end to this where you say these are all the things that we've learned and we will yes. not allow them to happen again well, well given there was an admission on McLean's part in 96 and at Terran Europe before he went on to UCD you know, that's that's the context. Uh, there is a quote from UCD in the piece, in fairness, and they say, the first UCD rugby club became aware of the allegations against John McLean was through a media report in 2018. And they go on to talk about how they're in compliance with the Children's First Act 2015 with the RFU regulations. And they also say the crimes are abhorrent and the devastation that his actions have caused to so many people is unforgivable. So that was uh, the UCD response to um, the questioning. But look, there was a there was a fall down somewhere. There was a fall down somewhere. Yeah, that's for sure. And, and look, it's 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 easy to. It, I, this has nothing to do with UCD. You know, in 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 some ways, because it could have been any other university that this happened in. I, I, I guess, or it yeah. could have been in any other in any other sports sphere. It's not a rugby story or a swimming story. It's a, it's a story of sport and society and how sport allowed. Or, or 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 created the the cover for this sort of thing to happen, and and this is one that has been uh, laid bare. So so it isn't about it, it, as soon as we start to point a finger and say it's about a particular club or about a particular sport, then then naturally the walls go up yeah. to protect. But it isn't about that. It's about it's about young men and young women 
who who went into situations trusting and had that trust absolutely taken away from them. And we as a society, society should surely provide them and the rest of us with answers that stop this from happening again. Yeah. We'll leave that there. If you've been affected by any of the issues uh, discussed, I'm conscious it's very difficult territory for a lot of people listening. One in four die is the website to check. Their phone number as well is 01 662 4070. 662 4070 or 1 in 4 die. Uh, Dan, Alex Ferguson, this uh, new movie premiered on Friday night and it was directed by his son Darren and really detailed his brain hemorrhage and the road back. And I hadn't realised just how. Um, well, difficult the recovery was. He completely lost his speech for a time, couldn't speak. My voice just stopped, Ferguson said. I couldn't get a word out. It was terrifying. I was trying to force out the words, but I couldn't get them out. And when the doctors came in, I was crying. I felt helpless, said Alex Ferguson. And then he was talking about just his fear he'd lose his memory. Uh, it would have been a terrible burden on the family. If I'd been looking at my wife asking, who are you? Everything was going through my mind. I thought, will I, ever, will I lose my memory? Will I ever be able to speak again? He had uh, five brain hemorrhages, or sorry, there were five brain hemorrhages, I should say, in the hospital. And three survived, uh, three of them died, only two survived. I was one of them, so you know you're lucky. Uh, the movie is Sir Alex Ferguson, Never Give In. I think it's out in May. But uh, a, a little peek um, behind what went on, because I guess, understandably, we haven't had heard too much from Ferguson since his recovery. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, I think, I think it's released in, in May, I think, this yeah. film. Is it? People might be quite curious about that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I suppose we associate Alex Ferguson as such a sort of a, you know, a, 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 a sort of fierce, you know, a, a fearsome figure, you know, and, and I think I was watching a, a clip during the week of like famous Fergie meltdowns, you know, in press conferences and stuff like that. And then you see, you know, the sort of the, the vulnerability of his situation, you know, that he found himself in. It's actually quite poignant that he's speaking about looking at his uh, wife and wondering, will she remember him? Because unfortunately, so many... Uh, football men of that generation are, are going through that, you know, in a different way through the issues with, you know, dementia and, and various issues that are being felt. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's 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 quite striking, you know, that he 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 describes this um this scene where he, he got the all clear and he walked out and it was it was sunny and he was thinking, you know, how many sunny days will I see again? Mm. Um, and I suppose it's, it just goes to show. I mean, I suppose, you know, would I've been too sort of a morbid about things but i suppose i mean the last year has been very challenging for people in a lot of ways and people sort of embracing or thinking about their own mortality and like ferguson you know is is clearly you know his own experience broadly has allowed him to you know reflect upon and and, and think about that um, and yeah I, I think i mean the quotes i suppose like you know it's someone who's been through a you know a, a, a dice with death speaking about it and I suppose there's nothing unusual to some respects about what they say. It's just the fact that it's Alex Ferguson saying it. Yeah. And you just sort of remember that, um, you know, he's been he's he's been through something that is uh, through an ordeal that is, I, I would I suppose change him in many ways. And and uh, yeah, so listen, I'm looking forward to seeing it. And, and I think there's other stuff in it as well, it's just about his career and his little anecdotes in there about Cantona and Ryan Giggs and stuff. So it'll be something for everyone, I guess. And you do always wonder, I suppose, something. You know, made by uh, his, you know, directed by his son. You're kind of wondering what what sort of picture will you get? Um, but it does appear like you're going to get some honesty. Yeah. You know, and and some introspection from him. Yeah. Seventy nine. I can't believe he's seventy nine. Yeah. It's just seventy nine. I mean, he's always in my head. He's always just fifty something and and full of fire and brimstone. Mm. I, I I think that says something about us all age, Joe. Know, but we won't go in there. No. <laughs> Uh, so we're going to be taking a break shortly and handing over to Stephen Doyle and Brian Kerber. We're going to continue on our social channels and you'll get the rest of the chat on um, podcast. I'm not going to open up a big can of worms because I do want to talk. There's, a, there's an amazingly kind of interesting thread from Gordon Elliott and social media into Neil Francis and the Sunday Independent talking about um, somebody impersonating him on Twitter for a long time and the, and the havoc it caused to David Walsh and the Sonia McLaughlin, that BBC reporter from the rugby and the abuse she received to Emer O'Neill uh, with Shane McGrath, PE teacher, and also she's on Orty's Homeschool Hub talking about uh, what she has to deal with. And it's all connected and, and this uh, space that increasingly we're living our lives and the difficulties with it. So we'll come to that in one second. What we do have time to mention in two minutes is uh, very interesting from Jonathan Northcroft 
in the Sunday Times. So if you've been sitting at home and watching the Premier League of late and you've been saying, God, it's very flat, the players are wrecked tired, they're not running as fast, the games are of a poor quality because of tiredness, well, Northcroft says the stats uh, prove the opposite, in fact. So a skill corner is the data programme used. And basically, um, last year, so the year Liverpool won the league title, was sky high in terms of number of runs at an intense level and uh, the speed of them. That was all-time high. And this season is up on last season. So Jonathan Northcroft makes the point, Dan, that this might be the atmosphere which leads us to believe it's all a bit flat or just, you know, we keep hearing it, so we're starting to take it as received wisdom. But actually, for all the tiredness out there and for the amount of games out there, the players are hitting higher speeds on last year and the number of runs at those high speeds also up on last year. Yeah, no, it's, it's very striking, all right. I mean, I suppose the one point you could make is obviously, you know, someone like Man City is top of the tree. I mean, they can rotate their players so, you know, the, 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 the amount they can, you know, the, if you could, the bigger the squads they have, the more capable of those that can come in can hit those levels. So you, you want to see some maybe individual figures for, for some of, say, you know, the questions around Liverpool and the, their fatigue. And I think, you know, they've had, a, a, I think they, they're up towards the top of the list of players who've paid the most minutes. So obviously there's that little caveat to attach to it. But I mean, I think it's just, there's also a broader point with it as well. But there's two aspects. One, yes. And I mean, the TV experience now, I'm finding it hard going. I think at this stage, <laughs> look, you, just, you know, you get so used to, uh, and maybe you get used to going to games and, 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 and you know, the closed doors aspect. But I think it's it's harder. I think it's 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 not as entertaining at all. I don't think people can pretend that it is. Um, but also the extent to which modern football is just so athletic as yeah. well. I mean, it's, it's just an extraordinary level of athleticism that's required and the importance of sports science departments. And you look at a Premier League glossary of the staff now, and below the line, there's like all sorts of uh, roles and figures and jobs. No, it's and true. this just brings home that point Two, as well. 2008, Royal, when Manchester United were winning the Champions League, that Tevez, Ronaldo, Rooney team, we yeah. all thought they were super fit then. The point is made in the piece. Uh, Premier League these days, in comparison with 08, features 40 to 45% more high intensity running than 13 years ago. So it's basically <laughs> doubled in the space of 10 years. Sure, and, and and I read the article and I thought it was really really interesting. But there is one piece here that says uh, another piece of uh, pre another piece of, of perceived wisdom is that all uh, the workload is causing unprecedented volume of injuries. Not true, um, but it, it, sorry, it's only at least over the first half of the campaign. So this this uh, data is probably only up as far as February, and 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 I just have a doubt with still about a third of the season to go, whether those numbers are sustainable. And the second point, which is probably more pertinent, which is it, it, it may well be, but the question is how long can they maintain that for? And you might find that a 33-year-old's career is going to actually finish as 31-year-old's career or a 30-year-old's mm. career because of the mileage that goes on the clock at 24, 25, 26. Yeah, an interesting point. We're going to take a short break here if you're listening on FM. Stephen Doyle and Brian Kerr are going to pick it up on the far side. Liverpool against Fulham is coming your way. Here on our social channels for the next uh, 15, 20 minutes or so, Ryan Nugent and Dan McDonald and myself will continue chatting through the Sunday papers. And just like that, we can keep going. So, <laughs> fellas, I mentioned that weird commonality between the Gordon Elliott story over here and Emer O'Neill, the PE teacher on RTE Home Hub, Neil Francis over there, Sonia McLaughlin of the BBC down here, and all in that space where we're spending more and more of our lives, Ryle. And I think <laughs> we can safely say none of them, Sonia McLaughlin, Neil Francis, Emer O'Neill, and certainly Gordon Elliott this week, having a good experience on social media. Uh, no. I, I'm. I, I. I. I went through the papers this morning, and I, I saw this theme emerging from 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 uh, all those articles that you refer to. And and whatever you believe, let's start at, the, at what what started this. Whatever you believe about the Gordon Elliott situation, however strong your view is, however morally outraged you might be by it, like what what is it going to take? Does it mean that unless he's sitting destitute in the corner of of a of a small uh, village somewhere? Uh, in in rural Ireland, where his life is in ruins and his family has fallen apart, is that the point of where you say, "Okay, now I forgive you," or now I'm happy because actually what you did was 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 worth that, uh, in, in my view. And um, is it okay because of the colour of your skin? Is it okay because of your gender? Is it okay 
because you don't clap somebody down or you're perceived not to have clapped the winners as Ellis Genge uh, it was given death threats and online because he was seen to have not clapped Wales down the uh, the uh, tunnel after their, their victory over England last week. And he receives death threats online. I mean, as, as Neil Francis points out in his article, like we have organisations which are designed to prevent rose deaths and drug deaths and alcohol deaths, etc. If they can save even one life, then the existence of that group will have been worth it. I wonder how many suicides worldwide can be attributed to what people read about themselves on social media. And, and I think we've got to a point, gents, where enough is enough now. Like, at some point, we need to be stand, stand up and, and be counted as, as a society. And, like, you look at what's already in place in this country. We have a broadcasting association of our broadcasting authority of Ireland that looks after the behaviours uh, and the ethics of television and radio. We have a press council that looks after the ethics and the uh, uh, behaviour of, of print newspaper. And yet, here we have platforms that are creating content, albeit content created by individuals, without any sort of, of um, um, uh, 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 sanction or censure. And it makes absolutely no sense to me, because we all know this is where we're going, and it ain't, we ain't dragging it back. But we do have the ability as a country, and Australia have shown it recently with Facebook and their attitude to, to them taking uh, um, new sources there without without paying for them or without crediting them. Like we do have the ability to to sanction that, and I'm not for one second suggesting that we in any way infringe or kill free speech before people jump on board and say that's the only way you can do that. You 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 do as a society have the right to say this is as far as we're prepared to go. This is as far as we're going to allow people to behave in public. And if you don't like that, well, then be somewhere or exist in some other space because it's not acceptable in day-to-day in, in -day activity. And, and I feel really strongly about it now. I think, that, I think that the Minister for Communications and the government have a role to play here and say, we need to start monitoring and managing the social media platforms for harmful content. End of. There's no excuse for not doing it. And, and, and if you're going to do it for broadcasters and you're going to do it for newspapers, why are you not doing it for social media companies? Somebody needs to explain that to me. Yeah, it's so tricky and difficult the more you look into it. So, for instance, take the Elliot thing. We're, say somebody was of the opinion, ban him for life. Mm -hmm. They're entitled to that opinion. It's not egregious. 100%. It's not punishable. But... If a million people tweet that, it's horrific for Elliot. So sometimes just the scale and the volume of it is as terrifying as what's being said in an individual post. I mean, definitely in terms of anything that's slanderous, anything that's racist, anything that's uh, outwardly, obviously horrific, done. Punishment, you should have to be identifiable via your social media presence now. I think we're all on board there. It's the, the, that's one aspect of it. The scale of it is a whole other problem. I, I, and I, you know, we talked about. Yeah, but I, I, yeah. I agree with you, Joe. I agree with you. But let's start somewhere. Sure, agreed. Yeah. So let's start. Let's start with you. Like sometimes a problem is too big to take on it in in its entirety. Mm. In, in fact, many times a problem is too big to take on it in its entirety. So you have to break it down into small chunks. And let's start with saying racist behaviour, uh, um, based on on race, religion, uh, sexual orientation, and all, all the things that we know that we're just not going to accept this anymore. And, 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 and the government has a role to play here, and it needs to step up. And let's start with that. The volume, I, I understand what you're saying about the volume, but, but the volume is the same as I, I'm, I'm going to pull from back in the day, whether a George Hook or a John Giles had a go at somebody and there were t two million people watching it. You know, like, you know, it's, it's a different impact, but, but the same principle. It was there for everybody to see and, and there for everybody to hear. They may not have agreed with it, but 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 that was it was there. But there are some semblance through the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland and the Press Council about what is acceptable behaviour in this sure. sphere. On the Neil Francis one, because I get the Sonia McLaughlin story, people are pretty aware of, and Emer O'Neill has been on the show a couple of weeks ago, and the abuse she's taken online, the racist I mean, abuse is is, is kind of hard to fathom. The Neil Francis one, you think, is going to be 
slightly funny at the start because he says, you know, I don't have Facebook, Instagram or Twitter. I do, however, have a Twitter impersonator who, who does a good job of ripping the piss out of me. And you kind of think, OK, this hasn't bothered him overly. But, you know, he goes, he goes on to talk about how my alter ego lives in luxury in South County Dublin. I'm waited upon by my butler, Von Smallhausen. I only drink champagne. Anybody who lives outside Dublin is uh, subhuman. My favourite post was about a lunch I had with Vladimir Putin, who worships at my altar, and on it goes. But then the serious side of it, I received letters, phone calls and emails from people I'd insulted and slandered. People I did business with hung up on me. I had to spend hours on the phone trying to calm people down on the back of what this guy was saying. Eventually, I had to engage a solicitor to try and close the account. It takes seconds to set up a Twitter account, but considerably longer to shut one down. He tells a kind of funny story back in 2012. He happened to be in San Fran and found the HQ of Twitter and he had to fill out a complaint on paper, pencil and paper. No complaints department, no phone number. And so he did not think uh, much of that situation. And he goes on to talk about the death threats, you know, received by Ellis Genge. Talks about James McLean. James McLean's had a rough time on social media recently. A lot of it comes from him trying to give as good as he gets. And that is a problem. If you're looking for a fight, you'll get one on those platforms. If you leave, you'll find that 99% of the vitriol will stop. What platform can they use to get to you and your family if you're off social media? What price, peace of mind? I don't know why sports people go on Twitter or Instagram. The superstars do it for money. For everybody else, it's just a lightning rod for abuse. Uh, and he does say time for the EU to follow Australia's lead. Otherwise, the cesspit continues to grow. Thoughts on all this, Dan? Yeah, no, I mean, it's... it's uh, how often have we spoken about this broad topic in the last month, you know? I mean, it's it's sort of... And, uh, you know, you, you sometimes wonder, is it like, you know, a reflection of even just lockdown circumstances over the last year? Has it just got worse or has it just been this bad all along and it wasn't amplified before? Like, I always associate Twitter with the, the, the beginning of it, like with the World Cup in South Africa in 2010. And, and it feels like, you know, social media generally has gone through stages since then. Because I like I remember you know the early years I didn't remember I don't recall there being like a Neil Francis like a fake account, um but I remember there was a like a big Sam one wasn't there as was a fake big yeah. Sam account and there was like that sort of humorous phase and I remember a lot of discussion around that time actually you know a lot of the you know discussion would have been that well, this is brilliant now for you know, social media for for sporting stars is great because they can get their own message out to the fans without having to go through the the middlemen or whatever, you know, and, mm. and it was clearly a more pleasant sort of uh, experience for them than having their sort of uh, their words, you know, mangled and spun by the likes of likes of ourselves or something. Yeah. But, it, you know, it got to the stage where it was a lot more light touch and, and sort of very, you know, good engagement. <clears throat> but it just seems it's just got to the stage where now it's just revealing the worst of society, like on a consistent basis. And even even a lot of them gravitated towards Instagram, which initially, again, a lot more... Um, you know, deemed a lot more pleasant, you know, and a lot less intrusive. And then all of a sudden now, no, I mean, you see the Shane Duffy stuff recently, you know, where a, a kid sending him abuse and, and basically got off with it. And I think the charity, you know, the, 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 his only defense was I wanted to see if I could get a reaction. Like I heard someone who worked for Twitter on, I think it was on radio on another station yesterday speaking about... Yeah, the ND, the ND of Ireland was on with Brendan O'Connor. I was listening yeah. to it as well, yeah. It was a quite striking discussion, but I, yeah. I have to say, you know, some of the defences didn't really, they rang a bit hollow. Like, the, for example, the line the line that was used at one point was, well, if someone would say five followers, you know, sends an abusive message to someone, um, you know, don't respond to it because, you know, if, if, you, if you leave it be, then only their five followers would see it. And, like, I, listen, I see where that's coming from, but, like... I'm not sure if that's a sort of a realistic appraisal. Like if you were, if if one of these reporters was walking down the street and someone walked up and screamed something into their face, but no one saw it, no one else was present present for this attack. You know, it was just only those two people who saw it. It's still going to leave a scarring impact potentially on the person who's been the recipient of it. So that really doesn't doesn't wash. You know, um, so I, 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 but but at the same time, like you know, and and Royal touched on it there. It feels like we're approaching a reckoning, but I still don't know what that reckoning actually is. Do you know? You know did, well, it would an interesting reckoning. Do you not talk to more more people who say, "I think I'm just going to get off this thing"? Well, I think that's clearly a. But, you see, younger players maybe aren't. You know, Aaron Connolly came off it recently and stuff. And I think people say that, but the problem you will have as well is that, like, you know, without us meaning to sound like we're too old, or you know, but you know, for a 16, 17, 18, 19 year old. They've only ever known like social media to be a, a massive part of their lives, and for them to, 
yeah, the big thing for them to do would be to pull back from it and get off it. That would be the sensible advice, but mm. that's not how not they happen. live. Yeah. Like, and particularly sports stars who, in many respects, are are living better now. You know, I, maybe I think about footballers. What well, I know, they can't go down to the pub and go for a pint. You know, and hang out with their mates because they'll be photographed. They're increasingly like drawn and pushed indoors anyway, as a reflection of a like professionalism and b just reflection yeah. of society. So. Um, you know, and they're used to they, they 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 love a version of the adulation and stuff that they can get off it as well, and you can't condemn them for that because that's deemed to be one of the perks of of what they get into a reward for what they do. So, but but, but we can't just get to the stage where where we're saying, well, listen, if you're a strong character, you should be able to handle it. Um, and no, you're in the man, you're them, man of you know? territory there. Yes, I think you are. Yeah, yeah I, I think that's the I problem. I don't, I don't know where it goes. Well, but 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 we, I, I like I think there's a reason. I don't still like I'm not expecting these guys to regulate themselves. I'm expecting us as a society and as, an, as and as a country to to regulate it for them and say like what is the difference between and it's not just a Twitter issue. Whether it's Twitter, Instagram, whether it's uh, whether it's Facebook, whatever it might be. Like where is the the BAI or the Press Council version of that? And why isn't it there? Mm. Because simply technology has moved on and 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 with it the 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 ability to to broadcast or the ability to to communicate en masse and to create content is there and it has not been regulated. Now that's a governmental requirement. Mm. Or else and I look I'd be very I'd also be very critical of some of the measures that are in place for the BAI and in, and and for the and for for press I think sometimes they're overbearing and they're 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 overly re uh, regulating but at least there's something there everybody has to benchmark and is held accountable to like this is this is not rocket science but there is a real lack of willingness to take it on and it's down to the government and down to the minister of communications to frankly step up yeah like by the way by argue. the way that Shane McGrath that Shane McGrath piece um, with Emer O'Neill is really, really good, uh, and and she's such a an interesting and engaging woman. Um, it, it's it's worth your time. It is absolutely. We had her on the show a couple of weeks ago, and yeah. in the main, just because the racist abuse she was talking about was so horrific, that was the bulk of the piece. But in Shane McGrath's piece, her basketball career is amazing, and eight surgeries on her leg was the other thing. She had eight knee surgeries in her time playing basketball over in. Uh, college and talked about just the extent to which you're almost a celebrity on a university campus over in the States if you're on the sports team. Like they had cards with their pen picks on them and they were signing them for the 16,000 students after games and everyone knew who they were. So it's kind of an amazing insight into yeah. jock life, I guess, because uh, she said it's exactly like the movies. Everything you see, it's like that if you're, if you're playing sport over in college. Um, we should finish up because it's a sunny day and I'm sure you two want to get out and get moving. Uh, <laughs> just, to, just to mention the World Cup 2030 treatment uh, by Tommy Conlon is fairly on point. I mean, he, he mentions Jackie Cahill, the TD, who wanted to bring the World Cup to Thurles. Uh, this, Tommy thinks, is unlikely, I think we can uh, safely say. And he says of this whole World Cup situation, there's simply too much work and botheration in doing a million small things well when you can come across all grand and visionary with talk of world-class this and state-of-the-art that and Bertie Bowl the other. End of the day, you can't beat a good feasibility study for a castle in the air with a corresponding cost-benefit analysis thrown in for good measure too. And he says, who knows where we'll be in the summer of 2030? One thing is for sure, we won't be in Semple Stadium waiting for the kickoff of Germany against Paraguay. Um, and he does say of Ireland's involvement in this, uh, you know, quite British bid and Boris Johnson talking about football coming home, which he says was an early diplomatic gaffe. Uh, maybe now Paddy is uh, happy to play the part as a sort of diplomatic mudguard for England post-Brexit, so as long as we don't have to cough up too much brass for the pleasure of the ride. So, uh, uh, Ryle, I don't know if you caught Dami during the week, he was quite supportive of this and wanted an end to the, <laughs> an end to the cynicism. <laughs> an end to the cynicism, said Dan, uh, during the week. I, I, I did uh, hear him, and I, my cynicism doesn't know where to start with this. I'm old enough to remember when we were talking about bidding for Olympic Games, guys, uh, and I, we, I walked through the two, 2008 debacle uh, quite closely, and then watched Ireland go for a Rugby World Cup uh, in another part of the uh, forest. And now and now this, I think, look, um, I have been and you guys have been privileged enough to go to major events. I, I think people cannot get their heads wrapped around the infrastructure and scale required for one venue, never mind 
14 or 16 venues, depending on the event that 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 requires and the money that's required to be spent to get to that level. Could we do it? Of course we could. We could throw money at it and we absolutely could deliver on it. I've no doubt about that. One of our colleagues sent a tweet during the week and I wish I could remember who it was saying, you know what? If we got to hold a World Cup, it could potentially create a legacy. How about actually spending a quarter of that money on the infrastructure of the game here and that will guarantee you a legacy? And and mm. and he was right. Like if if there's that sort of money available and and, it, and I think we need to be clear, it's not money that needs to be made available yet, but it will be in stage two once you get away from your feasibility studies, then then we're talking about an enormous financial commitment for a relatively small country. And and if you and if you want to cross sports for a second, they said that 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 New Zealand did it in 2011 for a rugby World Cup. A rugby World Cup, I've been to Poth, is a fraction of the size of a soccer World Cup. And the New Zealanders, frankly, by the time they got to the Rugby World Cup final in Auckland, yeah. were hanging on in terms of their ability and they did it brilliantly, but to deliver the final, just in terms of bedrooms and media facilities and all the, the bits that go with it. And, and that would be, in scale size, a Tuesday afternoon in the group stages uh, for a Soccer World Cup. Yes, and, and, yes. and people just need to, need to be real. There's many things that we will be terrific at as a nation and can continue to be terrific at, but hosting major sports events, I don't know why we keep going down this road. Yeah, I should say, because somebody's going to tweet Dan and not pick up my tone of voice, he wasn't actually saying, hold the cynicism in the World Cup beats. <laughs> I, I guarantee if I don't clarify that, someone's going to say, oh my God, Dan, why did you, why, Dan, get a grip. Uh, uh, so, look, I don't suspect your view has changed. Is there any piece, Dan, you want to point people towards as we wrap well, up? Anything else ca caught your eye? Like, we, it was well, lows in the papers today. Well, you're saying non-World Cup related. That's fair enough. I would point yeah. out that the, the back of the Sunday Times oh, news yeah, section has a quite decent piece on... Yeah, the, the the reality of the situation, I should say. Uh, just speaking to people who've been involved in previous bids uh, or are aware of previous bids, and just I, like people want to know where this thing is really at, like the, the where it's really at. And actually, I saw Martin Ziegler had a piece in the Times yesterday that it, there's I mean there's lobbying at UEFA for level to be done to beat Spain, Portugal. But I think the point is made in this Sunday Times piece that realistically it's only going to be the Aviva Stadium and, and Croke Park in the mix, barring a dramatic. And, and that's what like annoyed me part of, partly with this week. You know, you Jack Chambers out there refusing to deny this could be taken around the country and stuff like that. When And that that was what, you know, gave weight to everyone out there, every county councillor out there to put out their sort of nonsensical statement about let's build a, a white elephant sta stadium near us. So why can't we be involved? So like maybe the spin backfires on them all eventually when they have to explain, sorry, it's only going to be Dublin. Um, but, I, but I think that's a good Sunday. The Sunday Times piece is quite good because it sort of lays out uh, the Colin, uh, Colin Coyle piece, just sort of lays out, you know, the realities of the bid. And I think that's, that's you know, Tommy, Tommy Collins' piece is good and sort of, uh, you know, pointing out some of the sort of ridiculousnesses. But there's a sort of, uh, there is, like I said, a chance that this bid could take off. But we are very much off the wing of it, you know, and, and not in the heart of it. And that should be remembered. In terms of other stuff, yeah, there's lots of good pieces out there. Uh, Mark Gatter also always does sort of um, offbeat pieces. He has a piece with Cormac Comerford, who's a skier, speaking about his experience. Um, you know, that's that's a good read. It's page 61 of the Mail. Dermot Gillies has a column in the Sunday Independent to do with left-handed golfers. I think Bob Charles's birthday might be the context for it, turning 85. But there's no I mean, but like, like a lot of Dermot's better pieces. It doesn't need to be a news event in the week that prompts it. It's just a, it's just a good piece. And, encourage people to read that. The Goan Cows are at a piece in the sun with uh, Paddy Barrett, the uh, League of Ireland player who's just been in Cambodia, speaking about his time there. Um, so yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot of good stuff out there. Mark Gallagher has another piece about the Formula One years in Jordan. Mm. Um, yeah, lots of, lots, of, lots of good stuff out there today. It's a, I think it's a strong yeah. enough Sunday. And I, I agree. I think it is a strong Sunday. And, and there's a couple of pieces in the Indo. Um, one a very serious piece by Dermot Crow uh, about uh, the deep divisions that are being exposed in Clare Hurling. Uh, and that is a, a really good read. If it wasn't so, per it's almost a, we're almost getting into the whodunit sort of territory. Uh, uh, but but a very interesting read about Clare Hurling and, and, and worth your time. And also uh, for a bit of um, light relief, Joe Brawley's piece about... Uh, about referees, the men in the middle give as good as they get, uh, is a nice, uh, gentle uh, and enjoyable Sunday afternoon stroll. OK, very good. I would mention Dean Smith as well in the Sunday Times, Aston oh, Villa yeah. manager. It's actually really good. There's loads of just little tidbits in it. For instance, at Aston Villa now, Dean Smith has training at midday. 
back in the day, usually trainings at much earlier, you know, 10 a.m. traditionally or half 10. He says, we're living in an age now where the young lads are just playing PlayStation till one or two in the morning. So might as well let them lie on in bed, you know? So lots of little um, bits like that in the piece. He comes across very well. Uh, Tom Fox says, brilliant stuff by Ryle Nugent on the Gordon Elliott issue on Twitter. It's a position at the top of the moral outrage scale, given some other recent stories in Irish sport. And it does seem way off when put in that uh, context. Owen Murphy, um, agree totally with Ryle about the moral outrage. The criticism of Elliot and off the ball Monday, way over the top. The man's character torn apart before backtracking later in the week after they realised how bad uh, the initial reaction was. I would just say, Owen, because I suspect you're talking about me there. Uh, the statement was, or sorry, the um, picture was criticised. I mean, everybody took a dim view of the picture. I would just say two things. The statement was obliterated, for sure, but I think it had to be. I don't think that could stand, and everybody, you know, there's things you have to stand up for sometimes and say, well, that's not right, and I felt that statement was not right. We couldn't just take that explanation as a version of what happened and say, well, that's that dealt with. And the fact that Elliot spoke to David Jennings and gave a totally different version of events and says it was a moment of madness, as opposed to the statement which said, oh, look, you don't quite understand what's happened here. I was the phone call and accidentally sad, and I was just gesturing to somebody that I was on a bit of important call. I mean, I couldn't just come in here and say, that's fine. Like, he is also in a position of power, and there are horses under his charge, so that had to be called out. His character was not torn apart, actually. Um, and if you go to the YouTube video, 23 minutes into that YouTube conversation on Monday, hit play there, uh, I make the point he's having a horrible time, this is about the worst week of his life, and there has to be a place for forgiveness, and there has to be a way back for him. And then Johnny and Richard Forstall, Johnny Ward and Richard Forstall, both talked at length then about the quality of care he's renowned for giving animals at the yard. So that's what I'd say back to that. Um, look, it's, it's tricky, and you know I, I accept he's had a horrible week, but at the same time, on Monday, with that picture and that statement, I mean, there had to be criticism, is all I'd say back. Agreed. But you're more than welcome to tweet in that opinion, absolutely. But that's, that's what I'd say back to it. Uh, fellas, we're pretty much done. Thanks so much, Ryle Nugent, Dan McDonald. Thank you both. Thanks, Thank lads. you, yes. The Sunday Papers on Off The Ball.